Well, hello and welcome to another Teleaquarium program from the Alaska Sea Life Center. Uh, again, my name is Alex. Now, I'm not actually at the Alaska Sea Life Center today. We're doing this off-site. Uh, but back behind me, you can actually see our live stream from our bird habitat. If, uh, if you're looking for a little bit of relaxation later on, head on over to our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and you'll see under our live videos there, we're actually streaming our diving seabird habitat. But we're here today to uh, pick up from where we were last week, and actually the past two weeks, we've been discussing uh, some of the exciting research that goes on here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, uh, actually taking a look at shark research. So today, to go into uh, a bit more of our research, a bit more of how we observe, how we track uh, marine animals out in the wild. I'm joined once again by Dr. Amy Bishop. So I'm just gonna turn it on over to her and uh, we'll pick on up from last week. All right, thank you, Alex, and welcome back, everyone, to, as Alex said, our third week talking about some of the research that my lab and uh, collaborators do here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, primarily focusing on um, generally the behavioral ecology and the movement ecology and a little bit of physiology of some of these top predators in our marine ecosystems here in Alaska. So the last two weeks, we've been focusing mainly on our projects looking at the Pacific sleeper sharks. I know if you turned in for part one of that, you got to learn a little bit about why we were interested in these animals, um, primarily that they may be a primary predator of our endangered stellar sea lions here in Alaska. And so that'll come into play a little bit later. So I wanted to remind you, if you haven't seen that video, to check out part one to get the full story. And then, as Alex said last week, we kind of took you a little bit more in depth into just the shark research and talked a lot about what we are working with these animals in the field, so in the wild, what samples we're collecting from them, what we're trying to learn about them as an individual and as a population. And then some of the specific research we were doing, as you can see here, with sharks that were temporarily brought back to the Alaska Sea Life Center, where we could do controlled access studies on them to learn a little bit more about their physiology, like their metabolic rates. Uh, in both cases, when the animals were done either being processed in the field or when they were done staying at the Hotel Sea Life Center, uh, they were released and we wanted to be able to answer a couple questions about them after we were done having that access to them. And this is a lot of what my research focuses on, these questions of animal behavior and ecology. So when you look out at a marine environment, how do the animals survive in this very, very different environment? You've got to deal with pressure if the animals are diving at depth, which Pacific sleeper sharks actually do go quite deep, um, almost all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor. So they do come up and down. Stellar sea lions have this duality of life where they're spending part of their life on land and part of their life in the water. So what adaptations do they have to survive in that environment? What space is important for them? How do they interact with each other, whether that's others of their own species or how do they interact with other species in the environment? How resilient are they to change? So that's a big question that we have for pretty much all of the animals that we're trying to understand in this ecosystem. We know these ecosystems are changing rapidly. Um, definitely up here in Alaska, we've been seeing these effects of climate change and rapid environmental change at a much uh, sooner rate and perhaps a much faster rate than in other places in the world. And so understanding how the system might respond to those changes, what animals are maybe more resilient versus which ones are more vulnerable is going to be really, really important as we move forward for conservation and management. And then an important question that's been part of our research for both sea lions and sharks, especially the ones that have come in for those temporary controlled access studies, is we do want to know how these animals might be responding after our research activities. Are we having any impact on the animals through our actions with them? So all of this kind of falls under the umbrella of, like I said, behavioral ecology or movement ecology. And there's a couple things that I'm going to go over before we get into some of the data that kind of gives you a framework of again, why we're interested in these questions and how we go about quantifying or looking at data to be able to answer these questions. So the first concept that we'll put out there, you may have heard of this before, it's called a home range. And it's basically trying to figure out for an animal, what is the area where they spend their time when they are acquiring food? What area do they need for shelter? And where do they do kind of their social activity? So what is the total space use that an animal needs to basically exist to live out its life. So if we take an example of an albatross, this might be places where there's highly productive food resources. 
There might be places where they go to breed, which is again, more of a terrestrial site um, where they're raising their young. If we look at humans, we could do this too. So for us, where we're getting our food, where we're resting, where we're socializing. And if we were to map our movements over a long period of time, say a year, we would be able to generate a map. And so in this example, it's from a paper looking at albatross down in Antarctica in the Southern Ocean. You can see those different green areas correspond to the different spaces that the albatross used throughout a time period. So the total spaces they used is that lightest green color. There's actually a very thin green outline that you can see is the total home range. And then within that, we can actually look to see what is formally called a utilization distribution, but generally more of a probability of space use. So where are these animals most likely to be? And that's where you start to see those darker colors. So again, for example, the core space, so the most concentrated space use for an albatross is probably where it might be looking for food. It's spending a lot of time in those places. For us, certainly in the last month or two, my concentrated space use has primarily been on my couch watching Netflix. So if you were to have mapped me for the last couple of months, there'd be a nice dark green blob right in my living room. So these are some of the ways that we can actually kind of quantify what animals are doing out in their environment and understand a little bit about the spaces that are important for them. Now this plays a key role for conservation and management when we have these questions of how animals and human activities might be overlapping. So a very uh, common example and a great example of how this was used for management is the case of right whales along the east coast of the US. They are very prone to being hit by ships. Uh, ship strikes are one of the number one causes of mortality for this species. And there's not many of right whales left. Basically, their population numbers have been declining. So it was a very big uh, conservation and management concern to try to find a way that you can't tell the whales not to go somewhere, but maybe we could find some way to get the ships to have a less likelihood of hitting these whales. So by being able to, again, track and see where the whales were most commonly sighted, you can see here, and this was work done by the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, the hot areas, so the red areas, are where the most right whale sightings were found, going out from that to kind of yellow, orange, and then light blue and blue. And these lines here, the solid lines, were where the shipping lanes originally were placed going into the harbor. And they found that by kind of looking to see which areas the whales aggregated in, which areas were kind of their core use or those, you know, high probability areas for whales, they actually found that if they shifted those shipping lanes just a little bit to the north there, they actually could reduce the amount of whale strikes considerably. And after implementing that management change, they did see a reduction in whale strikes. So this is a great example of how you can use this kind of home range uh, behavioral ecology and movement ecology information to actually implement great management solutions for conservation. So, in the case of the right whales, most of those sightings were done from boats. You had people going out to look for the whales. And that's how a lot of this type of data can be collected for certain species. So if you have an animal that's very predictable, a lot of social animals that have a very kind of tight-knit territory, you might be able to go out into the field like Jane Goodall here or some of these other studies and hands-on observe the animals, track where they're going at some kind of frequency and be able to map then their locations based on your observations. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how you can do that through behavioral observations, check out the telegram from a few weeks ago where you can learn and actually practice taking some of that data with me as we're looking at our birds in our aviary. However, not all species are that easy to just go out into the field and observe them. You have species that are highly migratory. So at any point of the year, they might be in completely different habitats or transiting over huge areas. So it'd be very hard to try to keep up with them and track them and do that all just by observations. You have animals that are in very hard to reach places. You have animals that spend part of their time in the water and part of their time on land, and then other animals that spend all of their time underwater where you wouldn't be able to just observe them. So in those cases, What's really revolutionized our ability to track them and answer some of those questions I mentioned at the beginning of this um, is the invention of these satellite tags. Now, in the 90s and uh, the time when this technology was kind of just starting, it was the latest and greatest thing. You could put the satellite tag on the back of a sea turtle, 
Whenever it came to the surface of the water, it talked to the satellites and the scientists could get GPS locations or you know, a, a very decent estimate of their locations based on the Doppler shift of the satellites. And this really revolutionized our ability to track animals over long distances in the marine environment. Of course, nowadays, everybody basically has this technology in their back pocket in their cell phone. But this was really where some of this technology kind of became really integrated into ecology was this ability to be able to track animals and use that satellite network to be able to understand where they're going, especially in marine environments. And so here, as I said, is an example of one of those satellite tags on a sea turtle. And this is one of a newer model. You can tell that they're getting quite small. That's the entire tag integrated with GPS, batteries, and everything next to a standard USB stick. Um, so at the Sea Life Center, we've been able to use data collected from these type of tags. We're going to step back to those juvenile stellar sea lions again before we get to sharks. Because um, that's really when I came to the center as a postdoc, this was the project that I was working on with collaborators from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and Oregon State University. And we were really interested, again, um, as mentioned in the first video, stellar sea lions are endangered in Alaska. The populations have declined over the last year, uh, last 30 or 40 years. And it looked like potentially the age class that was most vulnerable and might be um, restricting the population from recovering were these juveniles. So we were really interested in understanding uh, what the utilization distributions for this age class were in our region. So where were they more likely to be spending their time? We wanted to identify and characterize what that home range and core space was, and then be able to start exploring if there was any differences in their space use. But, you know, were males doing different things than females? Did they have different space use in the winter versus the summer by age or in different parts of the region? So this is an example of some of the satellite tracking data that we got from five different animals. These are just their IDs here on the side. Uh, we had a total of about 88 animals that were in this study. Uh, the data was collected over a long time period. And you can tell just by looking at the snapshot of the five animals, the animals didn't all do the same thing. <laughs> so you had some animals like this dark purple, blue animals up here in Resurrection Bay that stayed pretty close to shore and they were using this fjord habitat. You had other animals like this pink and yellow individual who came out over to Prince William Sound or bopping around between islands. Maybe they spent some time in an island, went out to another island, and then came back. And then you have good old TJ11 that just decided that he wanted to go for a jaunt throughout the entire Gulf of Alaska and bopped around quite a bit. So these tags were able to give us that information on an individual basis. We got multiple fixes a day of what these juveniles were doing when they were freely just going about their lives throughout the year. The interesting thing about these tags is they also have sensors that give us additional information. And this can be really beneficial depending on the questions you're asking. So the tags that we were using also had depth sensors. So in between those location fixes, when the, whoops, sorry, when the animal came to the surface of the water, we got those GPS fixes, but it also gave us some information of what the animal was doing below the surface of the water. So we got some information about what depths it was diving to, how much time it was spending diving over a certain period of time. And we can look at that behavior then also in relation to some of these. So when we integrated all of that data for all the juveniles that we had, we were able to come up with, like I said, this map. And this map shows the home range for the animals in our study, which is that kind of white uh, space with the blue stipples. So anywhere there is the home range. That's kind of the total space use that the animals in our study used throughout the whole Gulf of Alaska. And then the blue areas, these teal areas, were those concentrated spaces, so spaces that juveniles spent a large amount of their time. And most of those concentrated spaces are by haulouts, which you would probably expect as animals that do have to come out of the water sometimes to rest. They're going to use the area around those spaces. Um, but interestingly, we did see a couple other places that we weren't maybe expecting to see as high use areas. So places like this narrow pass, Colross Pass in Prince William Sound, um, some of the fjords where we have tidewater glaciers, like Northwestern Fjord, was also a place of concentrated use. So this was a really great opportunity for us to see what areas were important for these animals. And then from there, we were able to do some of those other analyses, like I mentioned, and found patterns like males tended to be the ones that had larger home ranges and were more dispersive than females at this age. Now, bringing this all back together with our interest in sharks, like I said, our lab has been really interested in these predator-prey dynamics and understanding 
how potentially predators are shaping the movements of juvenile stellar sea lions and vice versa, and how this whole ecosystem is basically functioning through all of these um, interactive effects of species. And so we have looked at this in a couple other papers that I don't have time to go in today. So recently we looked at what behaviors, those diving behaviors that I talked about for stellar sea lions, might make them more likely to die from predation. So what behaviors might be more risky for them? And we also were able to look at some simulation uh, data to see if we could better estimate from a different type of tag where these predation events are happening. And so that way we could actually start to look at not just space use in terms of where the animal's going when they're alive, but we would actually be able to start making maps to predict where the animals might die, which areas are risky for animals to be in. So that's all stuff that we're working on on the side as well, and some of that has been published recently. So it's been really great working on those papers. But going back to the stellar sea lion predators, we didn't have much um, focus in this study on killer whales, though we do know that they are a predator of stellar sea lions. Um, most of killer whale predation is assumed to, or has been observed happening around the rookeries and around the haulouts. They tend to target that when the young animals are just starting to learn to swim in the water. And so really we were focusing right now and for the purpose of this uh, presentation back to sleeper sharks, bringing us full circle. So like I said at the beginning, when we caught these animals in the wild or the ones that were brought into the center, they were uh, tagged with satellite tags again and then released. Now, the satellite tags that go for a shark are going to be slightly different than the ones that we use for stellar sea lions because, again, these animals spend all of their time underwater. So there's no time where that tag's popping above the surface, talking to the satellites, giving us locations. Instead, we program those tags to actually manually detach from the animal. There's a trigger that uh, releases the wire, and then the tag is buoyant, so it pops to the surface. So we as the scientists get to decide how long we want the tag to stay with the animal before we trigger that release. So for the sleeper sharks in our study, we programmed them to stay with the shark for anywhere from 90, so three months, uh, 90 days, three months, to 180 days, so six months. And then when the tag detached from the animal, it popped to the surface, and we started getting that information from the satellites. So this here is a map of how the tag drifted. It popped up over here in Prince William Sound, and then we started getting the fixes from the satellite saying the tag's drifting, it's drifting, it's downloading data as it's drifting to the satellites as well. And luckily in this case, it actually drifted all the way back and straight into Prince uh, to Resurrection Bay. That's a pretty crazy circumstance that it would happen to come basically all the way back to the Sea Life Center, which is up here at the head of Resurrection Bay. And in those cases where it's possible to recover the tag, we always wanna try to do that because the tags actually retain a lot more data than they can transmit via the satellites. So when that happens, we can go out with some technology. Um, one of the tags washed up all the way to the head of Resurrection Bay here by the railroad terminal. And so we went out with this goniometer, which is this um, device here that Felina is holding up that basically is trying to receive uh, the connection with that tag and then it'll tell us a bearing. So it's a little like playing Marco Polo with the tag and we can search through the rubble and try to find it. And we've actually managed to recover two tags that way. So what have we found out about the sleeper shark so far? So last week I showed you this map. This is the locations of the sharks that we tagged in the last two years of our study. Again, this is Seward up here. These are all the locations where we tagged the animals. Some of them were quite close over here by 4th of July Beach and a few were further out by Cane's Head and Fox Island. And over the course of the following two years, basically, we found that the sharks did nothing similar to each other. So of those 10 animals, um, we've gotten data back from eight of them so far. And you can see here, this blue diamond is basically on Resurrection Bay. So one animal stayed relatively in the same area. And then two other animals actually were still within Resurrection Bay when their tags popped off, though it did pop off prematurely in those two cases. But for the other five animals, one went out to Prince William Sound, one took off uh, east as well, but not quite as far. And then three animals took off to the west, anywhere from down here north of Kodiak, through the Shelikoff Strait, and then quite far south and west down the Alaskan Peninsula. So that's really interesting to us. It's a small population, or a small sample size, sorry, that we're tracking at the moment. But it got us thinking about some questions that we might be able to answer if we had a bigger sample size and if we could continue this study into the future. 
So one of the things that I would be really interested in is we were seeing these sharks come into Resurrection Bay every summer. It looks like they head out in the winter because most of these tags popped off between November and March. So it looks like they go out to sea over the winter, but it might be interesting if we program those tags to stay on for a whole year to find out if the sharks come back to Resurrection Bay. So do they have any kind of site fidelity that within seasons they come back to the same place? Maybe they're following the salmon runs that happen in Resurrection Bay. Maybe they don't. They're such long-lived animals. Maybe a year isn't really a relevant time frame for the species. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens if we were able to kind of replicate and extend this study to a longer time period. Also, like the sea lion tags, the tags that we put on the sharks collect other data for us. So we let we get to know the depths that the sharks are diving to, the ambient temperatures, <coughs> excuse me, um, the light levels that they're encountering. And so all of that data can actually be integrated and we can learn a lot more about what habitats are important for these sharks, what temperatures they prefer, um, and the light levels actually, depending on how much data we get, can actually help us geolocate where those sharks are going. So we might actually be able to get a little bit more data about where they're moving between those points and not just the start and the end point. Um, so that's pretty much what we have for the data so far. And, and where we're trying to move this is really into this question of risk and, and this interrelationship between predators and prey. And so understanding that likelihood of juvenile stellar sea lions interacting with sleeper sharks, what does that look like in a changing environment? And we can apply those techniques to not just predator-prey dynamics, but things like what's the risk of shipping, as we talked about at the beginning? What's the risk related to the spread of novel diseases, which a lot of people are interested in right now? Um, we can look at the risk and how their movements and behaviors might change under different climate scenarios. And with a warming climate, what, where might we expect these sharks to go in the next 20, 30, 100 years? Um, also, as we mentioned in some of the previous shark presentations, this is a map of um, fishing efforts during a specific time period. All the little dots are different fishing vessels. And so we might be able to, again, help find balances between the fishing activities and sharks and find ways to avoid bycatch. So again, not taking the sharks out of the ecosystem when it's unnecessary and also not having that additional um, cost to the fishermen for catching something that they weren't intending to catch. So all of these techniques can really come together to help us answer these types of conservation management questions, which is really exciting. Um, so like I said, that's where we're at with sharks right now. We're still punching some of the data for the physiological studies. Um, analyzing a lot of the samples and a lot of the data from those processes. So we will be getting more of that as the uh, summer and fall progresses. But as always, I want to thank all of the collaborators who helped make this work happen, um, both at the Sea Life Center and with all of our colleagues. Um, these are our funders again and our research permits that it happened under. And I do just want to say that, you know, this is kind of the wrap up for this story. There's a lot of great research happening here at the Sea Life Center. And if you check out our science blog, there's little snippets from some of those other studies. So let us know what other research projects you'd like to hear about. Um, we'd really like to share what we do with you, but we're excited to see what you're interested in learning as well. Thanks. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions uh, right at this moment. But I want to encourage anyone that maybe you're not watching this live, maybe you stumble on it a little bit later on, uh, definitely uh, huck some questions down there in the chat or uh, in the comments, and uh, you know we'll always uh, be able to take a look at those and hopefully get them answered for you. But otherwise, like Amy said, if you are interested in the science the Sea Life Center is doing, uh, please check out that blog. It is really cool, uh, and it's a good little snapshot into uh, what research is at the Sea Life Center, um, which is frequently something that's kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and then if you're also interested, I got to plug it. Here, uh, we have a new show. Uh, the, the Alaska Sea Life Center is one of three facilities featured in a new National Geographic Wild show, um, which is Alaska Animal Rescue, uh, and that it premiered last week. It's on Saturdays, um, and it's available on Nat Geo Wild, but also Disney Plus, I believe, it'll be available on as well. Um, but I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Amy Bishop again for coming in and chatting about uh, some of this exciting research. I personally find it really fascinating seeing the sort of metrics that they get back from these tags um, and uh, just the, the ability to take that information and try to uh, put it onto models and, and figure out uh, what, what are the next questions they can answer. Because if you remember, 
This was all based off of sea lion research. They said, wait a minute, there's something wacky going on here. Came into the shark research, and you never know what sort of wacky stuff we're going to find in the shark research. So you never it's, know. <laughs> it's just never ending. Uh, but I want to thank you so much, and uh, we'll see uh, some of you, hopefully, uh, on our next Teleaquarium. We're doing these uh, a couple times a day now on our YouTube. And like I said, if you're interested in some nice, calming uh, relaxation, uh, check out our live stream of our diving seabird habitat that's on our YouTube channel right now as well. But thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Amy Bishop. Thanks, Alex. Yep. Thanks, everyone.